Shalom, shalom, and welcome to Treasured Inheritance Ministry. I'm Yosef Ben Avram, and you've joined me today for part three of the Revelation chapter 12 series. And I'm entitled part three, The Hope of a Better Resurrection. Now, as I say in all the teachings, if you haven't listened to part one yet, please pause this teaching, go and listen to part one as well as part two. I'd also urge you to listen to the full teaching on Elijah as well as the full teaching on Ezekiel and the priesthood. Now, brothers and sisters, without further ado, let's pray and then let's get into this teaching. Father Yahweh, we want to honor you and praise you today. And Father, we want to thank you that you are leading us and guiding us by your son, Yeshua, into all truth. And Father, we want to pray today, Father, that as we get into your word, that you will help us understand that we will truly have the eyes to see and the ears to hear. Father, that we will understand what it is in this generation that you desire from us. Father, that you are looking for a man and a woman to stand in the gap, one who will mature, one who is willing, Father, to lay their life down so that your life can be revealed through them to a dying, desperate generation. So, Father, as we get into part three, I really pray, Father, that you will lead us and guide us and that you will give us, Father, as I said, eyes to see and ears to hear, not only in this teaching, Father, but that we may comprehend the breadth, the height and the depth of your love and that we may understand that you love us so much and that you want us, Father, to mature. You want us to be overcomers and you want us, Father, to be people who are strong in this generation. So, Father, we pray that you will help us to be able to comprehend this. And Father, that it will not just be in our brains, but that it will go deep down into our hearts. In Messiah Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, in part one, we had a look at the life of Elijah as well as Elisha. We had a look at all the different signs and symbols found within the stories um, that is found in 1 Kings and, and further on. And we had a look at how important it is that we correctly interpret the signs and symbols found within the word of Yahweh. In part two, we explained the identity of the man-child. Now I hope in part three to bring everything together and to touch a little bit on the idea and, and the hope of a better resurrection. So my question to you is, what about the hope of a better resurrection? Is there really a separation in heaven between the holy and the most holy place? And you know, I feel that we've come to see that there truly is from all the teachings that we have done on things like the covenants and the importance of spiritual maturity. Those that conform to Yeshua's image, it is plain to see throughout part one as well as part two. Those who conform to Yeshua's image, they are the ones that share in his throne. And I believe that this is both a physical as well as a spiritual death. We need to die to self. But in the end, those that will die for their faith, I believe, form part of this group. This group that is as the forerunners, the Elijah that must come before Yeshua. Now let's take a look at a scripture that's found in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 5. It says, Women received their dead, raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Now what I want you to see here is that I want you to notice that Hebrews 11 doesn't indicate that they hoped for a resurrection. No, what it says is that they sought after a better resurrection, a better resurrection which appears to be connected to not being delivered from death. Let me say that again. It doesn't indicate that they hoped for resurrection. It's, it indicates that they sought after a better resurrection, which appears to be connected to not being delivered from death. Here's another scripture found in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37, and it reads as follows. It says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his stake and follow after me is not worthy of me. And he who has found his life shall lose it. And he that has lost his life for my sake shall find it. This is why I believe that this passage of scripture is so important. And I believe that it's actually talking about those who go from only being a a, a believer into truly becoming a disciple. One who follows the lamb wherever he goes. That's why I believe that the 144,000, they are sealed with the Father's name in their forehead. And that's why there's a difference between the 144,000 and the great multitude. Because the great multitude doesn't have the same sealing of the Father's name. The identity is not the same in them. And I can only assume 
that this having the name of the Father written into their foreheads, it actually makes them a special creation. It makes them a special creation. And brothers and sisters, this is not just a surface identifying mark. It changes them forever. Just as the four beasts have a special role and the seven angels of the seven assemblies also have a special role, these 144,000 have received the seal of Yahweh for a very, very specific mission in these final days. I believe that it's a permanent change. It ultimately causes them to be elevated and then to ascend to Yahweh just as Yeshua did. Now take note that Yeshua is the angel of Yahweh who has the Father's name in him. And the book of Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3 tells us the following. It says, Who being the brightness of the esteem and exact representation of his substance and sustaining all by the word of his power, having made a cleansing of our sins through himself, sat down at the right hand of greatness on high, having become so much better than the messengers, as he inherited a more excellent name than them. You see, brothers and sisters, the 144,000 are in the image of Yeshua. And as such, that's why they ascend accordingly. I believe that this name changes them and it gives them the ability to fulfill the very will of Yahweh for their lives upon this earth. And this would appear to be different than what is occurring with the Ruach HaKadosh, the woman that is in the wilderness with the remnant of her seed. She is with the great multitude in the time of the great tribulation. Now let's see if we can prove this from the scriptures. I'd also like us to look at Ezekiel chapter 44 and 45 because this also shows the place of the faithful. We have looked at this throughout all the teachings that we have done and we have contrasted the faithful congregation to the unfaithful. And the entire passage in Ezekiel chapter 44 all the way through into 45 is a prophetic picture of those who enter in and who are called to do the work of Yahweh. Now in Ezekiel, we see that the sons of Zadok, which is a picture and a type and foreshadow of the 144,000, they are the ones who enter in. They don't just, just serve in the outer part of the tabernacle. They actually enter into the holy place. And it's there that they get to change their garments. And we've already said that garments is indicative of what? Of our flesh. It speaks of them in place of Yahweh, and, and what happens? They go in to where Yahweh is, and then they come out, and they change their garments, and the scripture tells us, lest they purify the people. It's very, very, very interesting to see this. We need to understand the spiritual significance and the prophetic significance of what is actually being told to us. We are seeing, I believe, those that have resurrected, those that are going into the holy place with a different kind of garment, renewed flesh, and then coming out, officiating the judgments of Yahweh upon the earth at a later stage. Let's see if we can put this all together. Now in Ezekiel chapter 44 verse 15, it says the following. It says, But the priests, the Levites, the sons of Zadok, who guarded the duty of my set-apart place when the children of Israel went astray from me, They shall draw near to me to serve me and shall stand before me to bring to me the fat and the blood, declares the master Yahweh. They shall enter my set-apart place and they shall draw near to my table. Do you see that? They get to draw near to Yahweh's table. They come right in to where he is. So it says, They shall enter my set-apart place and they shall draw near to my table to serve me and they shall guard my charge. And it shall be when they enter the gates of the inner courtyard that they put on linen garments and no wool shall come upon them while they attend within the gates of the inner courtyard or within the house. Do you see the change of garments here already? They shall have linen turbans on their heads and linen trousers on their bodies and they shall not gird themselves with sweat. And when they go out to the outer courtyard, to the outer courtyard to the people, they shall take off their garments in which they have attended and shall leave them in the set apart rooms and shall put on other garments. And they shall set the people in their set apart garments and their heads they shall not shave, nor shall they let their hair grow long. They shall keep their hair well trimmed. And no priest is to drink wine when he comes into the inner court. And they do not take as a wife a widow or a divorced woman, but take maidens of the seed of the house of Israel, or widows of priests. 
And they are to teach my people, do you see this? They are to teach my people the difference between the set apart and the profane and make them know what is unclean and clean. And they are to stand as judges in disputes and judge it according to my right ruling. And they are to guard my Torah and my laws in all my appointed festivals and set apart Sabbaths. Now take note that in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8, it says the following. It says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. You see, this is the same linen from Ezekiel 44 as well as 45. The garments which the priests wear as they serve Yahweh. We are to put on these linen garments. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 9 says the following. And he said to me, Right, blessed are those who have been called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of Elohim. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, now this is where we need to really take notice. He says to me, do not do it. I am your fellow servant. So John immediately, we must remember this. John knows that he is not allowed to worship an angel. He knows that that is not allowed to be done. So he thinks that this is Yeshua himself. That's why he falls down at his feet to worship him. And this messenger turns around and says to him, See, do not do it. I am your fellow servant and your brothers who possess the witness of Yeshua. Worship Elohim, for the witness of Yeshua is the spirit of prophecy. This is where it gets very interesting. We need to understand that John mistakenly thinks this voice is Yeshua. He does so because it conforms to the image of Yeshua. And this is the voice of one who shares in Yeshua's throne. I believe that this is one who has resurrected and he is now in heaven. And this is after the death and resurrection of the two witnesses. Remember that. This has happened after the death and resurrection. It's Revelation chapter 19. We saw the death and resurrection of the two witnesses where? In Revelation chapter 11. So I would contend that this is a person who is in the image of Yeshua. He has died and he has been glorified and is now in heaven. And John sees this person and he thinks that it's Yeshua because we are supposed to conform to the image of Yeshua. He is in a glorified state. Now in Revelation chapter 3, in verse 20, it says the following. He says, see, I stand at the door and knock. Remember, this is the scripture that tells us that we are to that we will inherit with him. Just as it says in Ezekiel chapter 44 and 45, the inheritance was who? Was Yahweh. We inherit with Yeshua if we overcome. Revelation chapter 3 verse 20 says, See, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I shall come into him and dine with him and he with me. Then he says, To him who overcomes, I shall give to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. So it's, a, it's an image thing that's taking place here. Just as Yeshua sat down with his father, so we shall sit down with Yeshua if we overcome. And then he says again, which is the call of, of Elijah to the sleeping assemblies all the time. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. And again, brothers and sisters, I need to stress this point. It is not for the profane to understand the mysteries of Yahweh. Not everybody will understand these things if they are living a double standard life. That's why Yeshua, his own disciples said, why do you talk to these people in parables? And he turned around and said, for it is to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. To them I speak in parables. Because seeing and they do not see. Hearing and they do not hear. We need to understand this. Just the same as it was then, so it is today. Not everybody is going to understand this. Not everybody is going to want to understand it. So it's immediately after this, this mistaken attempt at worshipping, that this fellow servant shows him right there and then. He says to him, don't worship me. I am your fellow servant, one who has the testimony of Yeshua and the witness. And then he says to him, he says to him, don't worship me, but let me show you who to worship. Right after this, in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11, we see this. And I saw the heaven open, and there was a white horse, and he who sat on him was called trustworthy and true, and in righteousness he judges and fights. And his eyes were as flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns, having a name that had been written, which no one had perceived except himself. 
and having been dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of Yahweh. And the armies in the heaven, dressed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. What an awesome, awesome picture of Messiah Yeshua and the armies of heaven. Now, what we see here, brothers and sisters, is we can clearly see that this is the word of Yahweh. It is the voice of Yahweh, as well as the angel of Yahweh. It's all the same character. It's all the same character. The angel of Yahweh is Yeshua. The voice of Yahweh is Yeshua. The word of Yahweh is Yeshua. And he has the Father's name written, not on him, but in him. That's something that is very, very important to understand. And he has a more excellent name, as it said in the book of Hebrews. Now look at those armies that follow him. And this is where many people go, I don't know, they kind of seem to go off the path. Because, you know, we have a Hollywood mindset. Let me say that again. We have a Hollywood mindset about the book of Revelation. Because so many people have written books and so many people have done so many different movies about the rapture, about this and that and the next thing, we approach the book of Revelation with a Hollywood mindset. So many people think that the book of Revelation is actually the book of Revelations. But it's not. It's the book of the revelation of Messiah Yeshua and those that follow him, those that form his bride. We need to always understand that. The subplot and, and the rest of the story is about the wars and rumors of wars and all the disaster. But the main story starts off right in chapter 1 and it says this is the revelation of Messiah Yeshua and about those who will be married to him, his bride. That's what we need to understand. Now we need to look at these armies which follow him. We need to see clearly that these are people that have conformed to his image. They are in his image. The clues are all there. Because why? Firstly, they ride white horses just as he does. Just like Yeshua, he's riding on a white horse. They are clothed in white linen. Just like his, remember? His vesture was dipped in blood to allow you and I to have those white linen garments. The Bible says that he has a special name that no one knows. Isn't that exactly the same as what the 144,000 have? They have a name written upon them that no one else knows. So what is it saying? These are people that are in his image. They have conformed to his image and, and they are the first fruits. Those that, that are supposed to be, everybody's supposed to be like this. But brothers and sisters, let's be honest. We know the cost of this is high and that not everybody is going to want to lay their lives down. That's why there's such a big difference between a believer and a true disciple. Let's have a look at what it says in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 17. Again, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. And here he tells us, To him who overcomes, I shall give him some of the hidden manna to eat, and I shall give him a white stone, and on the stone a renewed name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. I don't know how much plainer this whole picture can be for us if we just get rid of our Hollywood mindset. So I would contend, that these armies in heaven are those redeemed out of the earth. The great multitude are redeemed through his vesture which is dipped in blood. And the Bible says, it tells us, these do not appear to be the 144 as they are all described as wearing white. Whereas the 144,000 are not described with clothing. They are only described with having the name of Yahweh upon their head. Let's have a look at this. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 14. And the armies in heaven, dressed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. And out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall shepherd them with a rod of iron. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness of his wrath of El Shaddai. And on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, Sovereign of Sovereign and Master of Masters. Then in Revelation chapter 7 verse 13, we see another picture. And it says, And one of the elders responded, saying to me, Who are these dressed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I said to him, Master, you know. And he said to me, These are those coming out of the great distress, having washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. So I would contend that these are the great multitude who have been redeemed out of the earth. And these are those who have partaken in the first resurrection. 
And I would assume that the 144,000 form part of this group because they were a special redeemed people right in the very beginning, whereas the great multitude is with them. I, whether this is true or whether it is fact, I, I'm not 100% sure. But I would believe that they both form the bride of Messiah Yeshua. The one has a special duty to do as a forerunner, whereas the other is redeemed out of the earth and they form part of the first resurrection. The Bible says that they follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And it would also appear that First, you have the ascension of the two witnesses, which is the 144,000, who are killed and then they appear on Mount Zion in heaven. And then you have the angel going out and preaching the gospel one last time to the nations. In Revelation 14, verse 6, it says, And I saw another messenger flying in mid-heaven, holding the everlasting good news to announce to those dwelling on the earth, even to every nation and tribe and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear Elohim and give esteem to him, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and the fountains of water. This passage of scripture occurs after the ascension of the two witnesses. And after the preaching of the gospel that following, it, it, it was after the preaching of the gospel that blessings were issued. It says this in Revelation chapter 14 verse 13. And I heard a voice out of heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the master from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, in order that they may rest from their labors and their works follow with them. So I would contend that it appears that these are the great multitude that appear in heaven after this preaching and subsequent reaping. In other words, this would be the Elisha, the one, those that flee into the wilderness with a remnant of his seed. Because the next scripture that follows immediately after the final preaching and reaping is Revelation chapter 15 and verse 1. And it says the following, And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven messengers having the seven last plagues. And for the wrath of Elohim was ended in them. And I saw like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those overcoming the beast and his image and his mark. So these overcome the beast. And we know that the beast has 42 weeks Whereas the two witnesses have 1,260 days. They do their testimony, are killed by the beast, resurrect into heaven. The remnant of the woman's seed flees into the wilderness. And these are the ones that have been spoken about in Revelation 15. It says, And for the wrath of Elohim was ended in them. And I saw like a sea of glass mixed with fire. And those overcoming the beast and his image and his mark. And the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding harps of Elohim. And they sang the song of Moshe, the servant of Elohim, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Yahweh El Shaddai. Righteous and true are your ways, O sovereign of the set-apart ones. Now, we need to take note of something that's happening here. Firstly, this is another sign in heaven. And it's not too far different from the great one day in heaven of the birth of the man-child that we spoke about in Revelation chapter 12. The Bible says that this too is a wonderful event, but it's not a great wonder. It's another sign in heaven. Another sign in heaven took place, but it is not a great wonder. We need to understand that. I would contend that these have washed in the blood of Yeshua and have become clean. But perhaps, as we saw in the book of Hebrews, there are those who sought after a better resurrection. I would contend that perhaps this group of people do not have the same glorification. They do not have the better resurrection as the two witnesses did right in the very beginning. Notice their redemption happens after the ascension of the 144,000 and they appear to be listed as occurring after the events of the 144,000 as we saw in Revelation chapter 15. It seems like this is happening after. So I would contend that this is the remnant of her seed. It is the Elisha remnant that has been gone out. And that I, if we look at the story of Elijah and Elisha, just for interest's sake, we come to see that Elisha had a double portion of of anointing upon his life. I truly believe that from the preaching and from the witness of the Elisha remnant, the first remnant, there will be a great multitude of people that will awaken to the truth of the message only after they have died and resurrected. And then there will be a great, great time that they will have to go through. It will be a hard time. But as we see, those who overcome, they sing the song of Moshe, the servant of Elohim, and the song of the Lamb. 
Whereas the 144,000 sing a song that nobody can know. Let's have a look at what it says in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 4. And I heard a number of those who were sealed, 144,000 sealed out of the tribes of the children of Israel. Of the tribe of Yehuda, 12,000 were sealed. And the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. And it goes on to explain how many of each tribe. And then it says in verse 9, it says, And after this I looked and saw a great crowd, which no one was able to count, out of all the nations and the tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, dressed in white robes and palm branches in their hands. Now let's take note of several facts. Firstly, the great multitude are clothed in white robes, and they are described as such after the events of the sealing of the 144,000. We just saw that now. The sealing happens in verse 4 all the way down to verse 8. From verse 9 onwards, is speaking about the great multitude. And each time that the 144,000 are described, they are not described as having white robes at all. In fact, they're not described wearing anything except the name of the Father. We also need to notice where each group stands. The great multitude stands before the Lamb and before the throne, whereas the 144,000 stands with the Lamb on Mount Zion, just the same as Ezekiel chapter 44, where the sons of Zadok are, they are at his table, whereas the rest of the Levites are outside. We need to see these connections, brothers and sisters, because the connections are amazing. So the 144,000 have the Father's name written in their foreheads. But both the 144,000 and the great multitude appear to, before, appear to be before the throne. But only the Lamb and the 144,000 appear to be on the mountain. So there's a big difference in the geographical location of where each group stands. The Bible also says that the great multitude is shown as standing on a sea of glass and not on the mountain. And you know, this is just like Moses on the top of the mountain. And then we had Joshua further down. And further from that was the 70 elders further down. And then the rest of Israel was at the base of the mountain. Now maybe you're saying, what has this got to do with anything? I believe that this is a picture of those that will be in the Holy of Holies, those that enter into the holy place, and those that will be in the outer court respectively. Or let's put it in a different way. Those that have entered the Abrahamic, those that the Bible says they... they they only entered in because they were saved. They did nothing else with their salvation. I believe that this is where we are seeing the difference between the Abrahamic, the Mosaic, the Davidic, and the Bridal. We are seeing the difference through all of this. Those in the Davidic covenant, I believe, form part of the 144,000. And ultimately, they also form part of the Bride. They are the ones that mature into becoming the priests of Yahweh that rule and reign with Him for a thousand years. It's very, very important that we understand this. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1. And I looked and saw a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written upon their foreheads. And I heard a voice out of heaven like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of a loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpers playing their harps, and they sang a renewed song before the throne, and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one was able to learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. And we've seen how that redemption took place. And I believe that it's a harvesting. It's a harvesting of the righteous. And that harvesting took place after their death. And then Yahweh allows them to be reaped, to be taken up into heaven. They are those who were not defiled with women, and we touched on what that means already, for they are maidens. They are those following the Lamb wherever He leads them on. They were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to Elohim and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no falsehood, for they are blameless before the throne of Elohim. Now, brothers and sisters, these 144,000, as I said, they sing a new song that none of the other redeemed can learn. No one else can learn the song except them. Not even the great multitude can sing the song. And the Bible says that they are virgins that follow the Lamb wherever He goes. And they are listed as being the first fruits unto Yahweh. Now, if the 144,000 are singing a new song that no one else can learn, what does the great multitude sing? And I think we saw that already. Let's take a look at what they actually sing and put it into perspective. In Revelation chapter 15 and verse 2, it says, And I saw like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those overcoming the beast and his image. 
and his mark and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding harps of Elohim. And they sang the song of Moshe, the servant of Elohim, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Yahweh El Shaddai. Righteous and true are your ways, O sovereign of the set-apart ones. So we see here that these sing the song of Moses as well as the song of the Lamb. And the question is, is the song of the Lamb the same as the song as the 144,000? No. The 144,000 sing a song that no one else can sing. And if these were the same songs, then the group in Revelation 15 would only still be a total of 144,000 and not a great multitude. So it would appear that the 144,000 are accompanied by the great multitude on their harps, but only the 144,000 sing the new song. I hope this is making sense. It's a lot of information, brothers and sisters. That's why you've got to listen to these teachings over and over and over. In Revelation 20 and verse 4, it says the following, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them, and the lives of those who had been beheaded because of the witness they bore to Yeshua and because of the word of Elohim and who did not worship the beast nor his image and did not receive his mark upon their foreheads or upon their hands. And they lived and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. I hope you're beginning to see this. These are the first fruits. The rest of the fruit is only harvested a thousand years later. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5. And the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and set apart is the one having part in the first resurrection. The second death possesses no authority over these. But they shall be priests of Elohim and of Messiah and shall reign with him a thousand years. So brothers and sisters, it says that these are priests of Yahweh that can enter the heavenly temple and that the second death does not touch them. It's after the thousand years that the general resurrection occurs. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 7 it says, And when the thousand years have ended, Satan shall be released from his prison and shall go out to lead the nations astray which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea, and they came up over the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the set-apart ones and the beloved city. And fire came down from Elohim out of the heaven and consumed them. And the devil who led them astray was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet are. And they shall be tortured day and night for ever and ever. And I saw a great white throne and him who was sitting on it from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away and no place was found for them. Now we need to notice and up until now, John has not seen the great white throne. And earlier, he had only heard the voice and then the description of Yeshua with his vesture dipped in blood. And I would suggest that what we have seen and heard up until this point has been focused on Yeshua and those of his seed, those that conform to his image, those that conform to his likeness. It's only now that we have the final judgment by Yahweh. It is only now that the final judgment comes by the one who sits on the throne. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 12, it says the following, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from what was written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it, and the dead and the grave gave up the dead who were in them. And then it says, And they were judged, each one according to his works. And the death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And if anyone was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. You see, it's only when the heavens and the earth are cleansed of all that's profane that all things are made new and Yahweh can bring his tabernacle down to earth. And this happens after the thousand years, not before. This is after the creation of the new heavens and the new earth that we read in Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1. It says, And I saw a renewed heaven and a renewed earth. For the former heaven and the former earth had passed away, and the sea is no more. And I, Yochanan, saw the set-apart city, renewed Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from Elohim, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the heaven saying, See, the booth of Elohim is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and Elohim himself shall be with them and be their Elohim. 
And Elohim shall wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, nor mourning, nor crying, and there shall be no more pain. For the former matters have passed away, and he who has been sitting on the throne said, See, I make all matters new. And he said to me, Write these words which are true and trustworthy. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Aleph and the Tav, the beginning and the end. To the one who thirsts, I shall give the fountain of water of life without payment. To the one who overcomes, he shall inherit all this. And I shall be his Elohim, and he shall be my son, sons and daughters of righteousness. And then we see that everything that is profane is kept out. In Revelation chapter 21 and verse 8, it says, But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Wow. Brothers and sisters, I hope that from the opening chapter of Isaiah in part 1 that we spoke about, I pray now that that opening chapter in the book of Isaiah, where Isaiah said, I and my children are signs and wonders to Israel. I pray that that is now making sense to you. You know, Yeshua and his children, which are the remnant, are to be signs to this generation. And truly, that is what's going to happen. Those that truly understand and, and take hold of the message now will be the forerunners once again. They will be those that will be calling all Israel to repent. And those who have ears to hear and eyes to see that listen to that message, they will be the ones that form part of that final Elisha remnant. I pray that you are beginning to see the importance of the sign and what it means. The final remnant are those who conform to the image of Yeshua. And they are willing to lay their lives down for his life. And not only that, but they are given a time, as we said, of 1,260 days to proclaim this message with a great display of power. And it's after their testimony that they are killed and ascend to be with the Father. They are reaped and become the first fruits unto Yahweh. Now the question is, do I believe that the 23rd of September is the day that this happens? No, I don't. But I do, I ever believe that we are to be alert to the truth of what the sign really means. Yeshua has been asking his children more than ever to get ready and to do the Great Commission. He has promised that during the time of trial, he will be with them. And this is what needs to happen. We need to take hold of Yeshua's words and run with it. Unfortunately, the majority of the body is listening to the voice of the deceiver. They are being deceived left, right, and center. And that is why there is going to be so, so many, pardon me, so, so many people who will not be ready when this all takes place. That's why there will have to be a great refinement that still takes place through the body of Messiah Yeshua. As it says in the book of Daniel, many will stumble and fall. Many will, many will cry out and wonder why is this happening. But they will go through a period of refinement because... There are so many things in their lives that still need to be dealt with. And you know, the Bible says that Messiah Yeshua has promised that during the time of trial, He will be with His faithful remnant. And this is what we need to hold on to. We cannot deny that the Scriptures do not line up. We cannot say, hey, you know what? The Scriptures are not lining up. I'm not seeing this. It lines up perfectly. We see the same in the book of Ezekiel, and in the book of Ezekiel chapter 44, we see how everything lines up. And we see who are those who get to go into the inner chamber and spend time with Yeshua. And then come out and change garments. And we already have seen that garment speaks about our flesh. Brothers and sisters, let us lift up our heads. For our redemption is truly drawing near. And I believe that the Father wants us to understand the times and the seasons that we're living in. I believe that yes, judgment is coming and judgment will come very, very soon. And when it does, the question is, where will you be standing when judgment comes? Will you be on the side of life or will you be on the side of death? Will you allow everything that is happening in your country, in your world, in your little um, house, in your, in your community to deter you from becoming the image of Messiah Yeshua? It is in this time, brothers and sisters, when the world is in a state of decay, that we are to be the sons and daughters of righteousness and have His light shining through us. I pray that these teachings have really spoken to you. I know that it has been a great amount of information. That is why it's been done in three parts. I will be doing, redoing a few teachings in the next couple of weeks. 
And one of them that I feel is of great importance is I am thunders. Where will you be standing when Yahweh's judgment comes upon this earth? And it will come. And it, when it does come, brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us very clearly that many people will still not believe that He even exists. Let us not be of those that deny Him. Let us be of those that are ready, pick up our stake, follow Him, and desire the better resurrection. Let us desire the better resurrection. Who cares about how it will play out? All we need to know is that we are walking in the light and that we are desiring to be a light to the nations, that we are desiring to be an image bearer of the one who gave his life for us. Let us live like that so that we can give life to others wherever we go. I pray that this teaching and the series has blessed you. I pray that Messiah Yeshua will be glorified in your life and through your life in everything that you do. Every word that comes out of your mouth, everything that you do in your work situation, in your house, I pray that Messiah Yeshua will be glorified through you, in you, and that others will know that you are truly a child of the Most High. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Yeshua. And Father, we want to pray, Father, blessings upon blessings upon your people. We want to pray, Father, that you will continue to refine them, that you will continue to take everything that is not of you out of their lives. And Father, that they will seek the better resurrection, that they will seek, Father, to run the race that has been set before them. And Father, that they will not be deterred by all the different things that are blasting around on the left and the right. But Father, that they will listen to your voice, as it says in the book of Isaiah, whether you step to the left or to the right, you will always hear a voice telling you this is the way in which you need to go. May that voice be the voice of Messiah Yeshua that lives within you. May His image be seen upon you every single day of your life. You're going out and you're coming in. May people know that this is a daughter of the King, a son of righteousness, someone who walks and lives what they believe in a place where there is only darkness and despair. May you be the light as Yeshua was the light in His generation. I pray that this word and this message has blessed you. I pray that you will grow strong in him and that you will never ever compromise on your faith. Be blessed in Yeshua's name. Amen.